Um, is this on? Okay, great. Well, welcome, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you uh, for joining us. This is the last uh, distinguished lecture series for the Institute of Experiential AI for the academic year. We resume again in September with a full program for the year. As you also know, in parallel, every two weeks, we run the Expeditions in Experiential AI series, uh, which is designed to feature a lot of our uh, Northeastern University experts and uh, faculty and, and so forth. Uh, in two weeks, definitely join us for a talk by Silvio Amir on a super interesting topic who's, who's at the Khoury College. My name is Osama Fayyad. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Experiential AI and also Professor of the Practice in the Khoury College for Computer Sciences. And it is my pleasure today to introduce Jan Lequin. Uh, Jan is a very well-known name in the field. I've known him for many years. I think I, at one point in my life, I interviewed at Bell Labs or AT&T Labs and that's when he was there. Uh, he is VP and Chief AI Scientist at Meta, also known as Facebook, and uh, Silver Professor at NYU, affiliated with the Kuo Institute of Mathematical Sciences and the Center for Data Science, which he actually founded. Uh, he was the founding director of FAIR. I learned this morning that FAIR used to stand for Facebook AI Research. Now it's changed to MetaFAIR, for fundamental AI research. Um, and uh, uh, of course, he founded the uh, NYU Center for Data Science, received an engineering diploma from SEA in Paris, and a PhD from the Sorbonne University. Uh, after a postdoc in Toronto, he joined AT&T Labs in 1998, uh, and uh, sorry, AT&T Bell Labs, which got renamed to AT&T Labs in 96 as head of uh, image processing research. He joined NYU as professor in 2003 and Meta, Meta or Facebook in 2013. He is the recipient of the 2018 ACM Turing Award along with uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Bengio. And for those of you who don't know the Turing Award, it's essentially the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for computer science, uh, the toughest award to get uh, from the ACM. Uh, the award was for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National uh, Academy of, of Engineering, amongst many others. Um, his interests include AI, machine learning, computer perception, robotics, and computational neuroscience, and I'm sure you're all eager to hear from Jan uh, on what's been happening with generative AI and, and all, what, what all the buzz is about. Hopefully we'll get into the technical details and immediately following his talk we will do a fireside chat where I will try to ask him some tough questions. Uh, and then we will also get uh, questions from the audience. By the way, we did get online questions from the audience. We got 150 questions. So there's no way we're going to walk you through all of those. So we'll see how much uh, time allows us to answer. Thank you. And please join me in welcoming Jan to Northeastern University. Uh, thank you, Usama. Uh, a real pleasure to be here. And thanks for coming here so numerous uh, or for listening in uh, online. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about the state of the art in AI, but also about the next step, because I'm always interested in uh, the next step uh, and, and how we can make machines more, more intelligent. And uh, we need to figure out how to get machines that can not just learn, but also can reason and plan. And current uh, AI really does not allow, us, uh, allow current systems to do this. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to kind of sketch a potential pathway towards uh, such, such systems. I can't say that we built it completely, uh, but uh, we built some components and I'll go through this. So um, AI is in the news. Everybody is playing with it at the moment. Um, it's pretty amazing how it works. Uh, there's a lot of success. It's been very widely deployed, very much in many applications, a little behind the curtain, but in, in some of them much more visible. 
So LLMs have the advantage of being visible, but for the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, there's massive use of uh, AI and the latest development of AI for such thing as uh, uh, ranking for search engine and social networks or for content moderation, um, things like that. So, but overall, uh, machine learning requires a lot of data and the machines that we have are somewhat brittle, specialized. They don't have human level intelligence despite uh, what we may be uh, led to believe. Um, so in short, uh, machine learning sucks. <laughs> At least compared to humans and animals. Um, we've been using uh, supervised learning, which really was the workhorse of, uh, of machine learning and AI systems uh, uh, until very recently. Uh, reinforcement learning is uh, insanely inefficient, but it works really well for games, but not many other things. Um, so one thing that has taken over uh, the, the AI world in the last few years is something called self-supervised learning, which I will talk about uh, uh, at length. But current AI systems are specialized and brittle. They make stupid mistakes. They don't really reason and plan, with a few exceptions for game playing, for example. Um, compared to humans and, uh, and animals, they can learn new tasks extremely quickly, understand how the world works, um, can reason and plan, have some level of common sense. Machines still don't have uh, common sense. So how do we get machines to reason and plan like uh, animals and humans, learn as fast as animals and humans? Uh, and we'll need machines that can understand how the world works, can predict the consequences of their actions, uh, can perform chains of reasoning uh, with unlimited number of steps, can plan complex uh, tasks by decomposing them into simpler tasks. Um, so let's start with this idea of self-supervised learning. It's really taken over the world. Uh, uh, every sort of top machine learning system today use, so, uses some form of self-supervised learning as a, as a first step to pre-train the, the system. Uh, and it's used everywhere. Uh, what does it consist of? It's really the idea that instead of having of training a system with an input and an output, which is the case in supervised learning, or with an input and a reward, which is the case for reinforcement learning, you train the system to basically model its input. You don't train it for any particular task other than capture the dependency between different parts of its input. So one thing you might do is, for example, take a, a piece of video or a piece of text, uh, show a piece of the video to the system, and ask it to predict the missing piece, like the, the continuation of that video. And after a while, you reveal the rest of the video and you adjust the system so that it does a better job at, at predicting. Okay? So prediction really is kind of the essence of intelligence. And to some extent, by training a system to predict, it doesn't have to be predicting the future. It could be predicting the past or the left from the right. Um, you're, you're training the system to represent data, essentially. And that's been nothing short of astonishingly successful in the domain of uh, natural language understanding. So every uh, top performing NLP system today uh, is pre-trained uh, the following way, or with some form of the following way, which is a special case of an old idea called denoising autoencoder. And the idea is that you take uh, a piece of text, sequence of words from a, a corpus. Uh, uh, typically, it would be a few hundred or a few thousand words long. Uh, those words immediately get uh, turned into vectors, but uh, let me not talk about this for just now. So the first thing you do is you corrupt this text. You remove some of the words and replace them by blank markers, or you substitute them for another word. And then you train some gigantic neural net to predict the words that are missing. In the process of doing so, the system has to basically develop some sort of understanding of the text because if you want to be able to predict what, what word comes, uh, comes here, you have to understand the role of the word in the sentence, the type of uh, uh, word that comes here, and, and the whole meaning of the sentence. So the, the system act basically learns to represent text. And the amazing thing is that just by doing this, you can train a system to represent the meaning of text in pretty much any language, as long as, long as you have data. With a single system, you can have a system that represents the meaning of uh, a piece of text in any language. Um, so pretty cool, you can use this to uh, build uh, translation systems, uh, systems that detect uh, hate speech on uh, social networks or figure out what something talks about. And the way you do this is that you, uh, you chop off the last few layers of that uh, genetic uh, neural net and you use the representation, the internal representation uh, learned by the system as input to a subsequent downstream task 
that you train supervised, like say translation. Um, and it's really astonishing how well this works. Uh, so from this to generative AI system, there's a small step, particularly for text generation. Uh, image generation is a completely different thing, which I'm not going to talk about. But uh, although some systems use the same technique. Uh, so what is a, a generative uh, uh, a text generation system, a large language model? It's a system of the type I just described, except that when you train it, you don't uh, remove uh, random words in the text that you show at the input. You only remove the last one. Okay? So you train the system to predict the last word in a sequence of words. Uh, so show a sequence of words, and then uh, show the last word, and train some gigantic neural net, perhaps with billions or hundreds of billions of parameters, to predict the next word. And you have to train this on uh, you know, trillions of, uh, of uh, text uh, snippet, typically one to two trillion for the, the biggest models. Once you have that system, you can use it to generate text using what's called autoregressive prediction, which is a very classical thing to do in signal processing. So you take a piece of text called a prompt, you enter it into the, into the system, you have it predict the next word, um, and then you, you shift that word into the input. So now it becomes part of the uh, input to the system. And now you can predict the next next word, shift it in, predict the third word, shift it in. That's autoregressive prediction. And that's how the, all the big LLMs that everybody has played with uh, work. That's how they've been trained. That's how they generate text. Um, so uh, those, uh, those LLMs are kind of amazing in terms of the, perform the performance that they, 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 they produce. Um, so again, they're trained on something like one to two trillion tokens. Uh, a token is like a word or a subword unit. Um, and there's a whole bunch of those models, most of which you probably haven't heard of, but there's a few that uh, have become uh, you know, household names. So we've heard of uh, you know, ChatGPT and GPT-4 from uh, OpenAI, which uh, are kind of you know, usable, barred from uh, Google, uh, and uh, you know, derivative of ChatGPT GPT-4 from, uh, from Microsoft, um, married with Bing. But there, there's, there's a long history of those things that, that, that goes back several years. Uh, some from uh, FAIR, Blunderbot, and Galactica. Galactica was uh, trained to on the scientific literature. And it's designed to help scientists write papers. Um, and a more recent one which, uh, called LAMA, which um, is uh, the code is open source. The model, you can uh, get it on request if you are using it for research purpose. Uh, and it's uh, the same level of performance as things like uh, ChatGPT, but it's not fine-tuned. You have to fine-tune it for application. And in fact, people have done this. So Alpaca is a, is a model which basically is a fine-tuned version of Llama that was built by people at Stanford uh, for um, answering questions and things like that, instruction. So they, they're, they're pretty amazing. Uh, they surprised a lot of people in how well they work. But they make a lot of factual errors, logical errors, inconsistencies. Uh, limited reasoning abilities, uh, things like that. And they're, they're easy to, um, they're, they're pretty gullible. So you tell them, you know, what is two plus two? And the system will say four. And you say, no, actually two plus two equals five. Oh yeah, you're right, I made a mistake. You know, so they, you know, they kind of, um, they, they predict uh, answers that would sound like someone could produce these answers, but the details might be wrong. Okay, so you can't really use them for uh, factual uh, uh, answers, but you can use them certainly for uh, writing aids. And particularly, it works really well for, uh, for text or for you know, st standard sort of templatized text that you need to, um, to write. Like, I don't know, there's a bunch of professors here that have to spend quite a bit of time writing recommendation letters for students. Uh, very useful for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and very useful for code generation. So the software industry is probably going to be revolutionized by such tools. So this is an example of code generated from a prompt by the, the Llama 65 billion model, the open source one. So uh, you know, ask it, you know, find real roots of uh, AX squared plus BX plus C, and the thing just writes a function in Python or whatever, whatever you want, or regex or whatever. Who remembers the syntax of regex? Like, um, and you can have it, uh, you know, hallucinate text that might sound plausible or completely implausible like this. 
did you know that Yann Kuhn dropped a rap album last year? We listened to it, and here is what we thought. And the thing writes a review of my alleged uh, rap album. Um, I'm not much of a rap person. I'm more of a jazz person. So when my colleagues showed, me, showed this to me, I, I told them, like, can you do the same for like, a jazz album? That would be kind of more appropriate. I, I mean, I'm a terrible performer. But, um, and I said, yeah, we tried already. But it didn't work very well because there's not enough training data on the web of reviews of jazz albums. I found that incredibly sad. I cried. Um, <laughs> So you need a lot of data to train those things, right? In fact, the amount of data, like something like 1.5 trillion token that Lama is, is trained on, it would take about 22,000 years for a human reading eight hours a day at every speed to read the whole material. So obviously, those things can accumulate a lot of knowledge, at least approximately. Um, so yeah, writing assistance, code generation, uh, first draft of a lot of stuff. They're not good for producing factual and consistent answers, at least not yet. So a lot of LLMs now are being augmented or extended so that they can use tools like, like calculators or database engines or whatever uh, to search for information and then refer to the source. Uh, they're not good at all for reasoning, planning, or, or even for arithmetics. Um, so, but we are easily fooled by their language fluency into thinking that they are intelligent. They're not that intelligent. Um, and they really have no understanding of the physical world because they're trained with text. And there's another flaw, which is a huge problem. Uh, it's the fact that um, if you imagine that there is uh, the set of all possible answers represented by this sphere, disk, uh, which is really a tree, right? Every token you output, you have a certain number of options for what the token should be, what the word is. So it's a tree of all possible answers. Within this tree, there is a small subtree that corresponds to correct answers uh, for the, the question being asked. And imagine that there is a probability E for uh, any token that is produced by the system to be outside, to take you outside that tree of correct answers. Okay? Once you go outside that tree, you can't come back because it's a tree. So um, let's imagine that the, the probability per token is, is uh, E. So the probability that a sequence of n tokens would be correct is 1 minus e to the power n, making the assumption that the errors are independent, which of course they're not. But, um, but that's kind of a crude assumption. And so the problem with this is that the, it's an exponentially divergent process, this autoregressive prediction. Errors accumulate. And uh, if you produce too many tokens, the thing will sort of diverge away from uh, the set of correct answers exponentially. And that's not fixable with the current architecture. Um, you can fine tune those systems uh, a lot um, to reduce E, but you're not going to make it go away. So I have a bold prediction, which is that the uh, shelf life of autoregressive LLM is very short. My prediction is that five years from now, nobody in their right mind would use them. So enjoy it while it lasts. Um, they'll be replaced by things that are better, <laughs> okay? And, and I'll hint about, uh, uh, about directions to kind of perhaps fix up those problems. Uh, so this is a, a paper that uh, uh, Jake Browning, who's a philosopher, and, 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 and I published in the Noema magazine, uh, which is a philosophy magazine, about the fact that a system that is purely t were, uh, trained from, from text, from language, cannot possibly attain uh, human-level intelligence because much of what humans know is actually derived from experience of the uh, physical world. This is true for a lot of human knowledge, but it's, it's true certainly for almost the totality of animal knowledge. It's, it's all about the, the world. It's no, not lang linguistic related, no language related. So linguistic abilities and fluency are not related to the ability to think. Th those are two different things. Um, there are some uh, criticisms of uh, autoregressive LLMs from people uh, coming from the cognitive science uh, realm who, who say, like, this is not at all the way the human mind works. Uh, there is, like, essential missing pieces. Other criticism for people who come from sort of more classical AI, pre-deep learning, um, who say, like, you know, AI systems are supposed to be able to plan and, and reason, and those, those LLMs can do it. Or at least not, you know, they can do it maybe in very sort of primitive forms. 
perhaps they can plan things in situations that correspond to uh, a template that they've been trained on, but, but they're not so uh, innovative. So we should ask, how is it that humans and animals um, can learn so quickly? Uh, and uh, I've been using this, uh, this diagram for quite a while now, several, uh, many years, uh, from Emmanuel Dupoux, who's a, a cognitive scientist in, uh, in Paris. And we try to sort of uh, make a chart of at what age uh, babies learn basic concepts about the world. Um, so things like uh, distinguishing between animate objects and inanimate objects, learning the notion of object permanence, the fact that when an object is hidden behind another one, it still exists. Uh, notion of rigidity, solidity, things like natural categories. Uh, babies don't need to know the name of an object to actually know that there are different categories of objects around four months or so. And then it takes about nine months for babies to really understand that um, sort of intuitive physics that uh, objects that are not supported will fall, uh, that uh, you know, um, objects have a momentum, a weight, friction, you know, knowing that um, if I push on this object, um, uh, you know, light objects like this, they're gonna move, but if I push on an object that's uh, heavier, it's not gonna move unless I push harder. So things like that. So if you show a, a six-month-old baby or five-month-old baby the scenario here on the left where you have a, a little car on a platform, you push the car off the platform, it appears to float in the air. A uh, five-month-old baby will barely pay attention. A 10-month-old baby will go like this because um, she understood that uh, by then that objects that are not supported are supposed to fall and this object appear appears to be floating in the air. So we can determine that her mental model of, of the world uh, is being violated. Okay, that's how this chart was, was built. Um, so we accumulate as babies an enormous amount of background knowledge about how the world works, uh, mostly by observation, a little bit by interaction, when we start being able to kind of grab things. Uh, but in the first few months, it's mostly just uh, observation. And we don't know how to reproduce this with this type of learning with machines. Um, once we accumulate all this background knowledge, you know, in uh, a number of years, uh, learning a new task like driving is very fast. So any teenager can learn to drive in about 20 hours of practice, mostly without causing any accident. Um, so the teenager doesn't have to run off a cliff to figure out that the car, that nothing good is gonna happen if you run off a cliff. Uh, the mental model of the world is already there, okay? Uh, we still don't have level five self-driving cars. So obviously we're missing something pretty big. Um, any 10-year-old can clear up the dinner table and fill up the dishwasher. We're nowhere near having robots that can do this. And it's not because of mechanical design. It's because we don't know how to build the, the, the minds behind it. Um, so we're missing something big, right? The, the, the path towards human-level AI is not just making LLMs bigger. That's just not going get, to get us there. It's been a common recurring error by... Uh, AI scientists and engineers over the last six decades to imagine that the one thing that they just discovered was the solution to uh, human level AI, only to discover a few years later that no, there was actually a big obstacle that another obstacle they had to clear. It's a recurring, recurring history uh, story in, uh, in AI. So common sense will probably emerge from the ability of machines to learn how the world works by observation the way babies and animals do it. Um, so I see three challenges for AI research over the next decade or so. Uh, learning representations of the world and predictive models of the world. I'll, I'll, I'll say why in a minute. And self-supervised learning is going to be the, the key uh, component of that. Uh, learning to reason. So uh, psychologists uh, talk about system one and system two. System one is the type of um, uh, uh, control that, that our brains use uh, to kind of react to something without really having to think about it, like subconscious action. So if you are an experienced driver, you don't have to think about driving. You can just drive and you can talk to someone at the same time and barely pay attention. Uh, uh, so that's system one. But then when you are learning to drive, you pay attention to absolutely everything. You use your entire uh, focus, consciousness, attention to, um, uh, to drive. And that's system two. Um, and then the last thing is learning to plan complex uh, action sequences. 
uh, decomposing them into simpler ones. So I, I wrote uh, a sort of vision paper um, uh, about a year ago, which I uh, posted on uh, Open Review uh, for comments. So you're welcome to comment on it. Uh, I gave a bunch of technical talks about it. One of the earliest one was uh, at Berkeley, but, um, but you are having a more recent version of it right now, so you don't need to look at that one. Um, and, uh, and it's based on what's called a cognitive architecture. So basically, how can we sort of design a system with different modules so that those modules may uh, implement all the properties that I was uh, telling you about so systems can uh, perceive reason, predict, in particular predict the consequences of their actions, and then plan a sequence of actions to optimize, a, uh, to satisfy a particular objective. Okay, so the main uh, components of the system uh, is, uh, uh, the, 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 the key component, uh, I would say, is the world model. And the world model is what allows the system to uh, predict ahead, imagine what's gonna happen. Uh, this is, to some extent, what current AI systems don't really have. Uh, perception system basically gets an estimate of the state of the world uh, and initializes the world model with it. Uh, the cost here is a really important module. So basically, the entire purpose of the, of the agent is to uh, minimize this cost. Okay? So the cost is uh, something that is measured uh, uh, uses a measurement of the state of the, of the agent, particularly the prediction from the world model, and predicts whether an outcome is going to be good or bad. And the entire purpose of the agent here is to figure out a sequence of actions, so this is uh, taking place in the actor, figure out a sequence of actions such that when I predict what's going to happen as a consequence of those actions using my world model, my objective, my cost function will be minimized. Okay, so if my cost function is, uh, uh, so the cost function is basically are measures of discomfort of the uh, agent. Uh, we, uh, uh, biological brains have, have things like that in the basal ganglia. So this is the thing that tells you when you're hungry, for example, or you're hurting. Um, so nature tells you you're hungry. The nature doesn't tell you how to feed. You have to figure that out by yourself, perhaps using your world model and your planning abilities. Um, so this is the same thing here. Imagine this is a robot, and the robot battery are kind of uh, starting to get drained. So there's a cost function here that says, uh, uh, be careful, you're running out of power. Uh, and so the system, according to its world model, would say, well, uh, you know, I can recharge my battery by you know, plugging myself into a socket. Um, so it figures out the sequence of actions to uh, plug itself into a socket, and that will eventually minimize the cost function that just appeared. Um, so in fact, uh, there's two ways to uh, operate that, that, that system. One is the kind of system one, where the, the system makes an estimate of the state of the world, run this to a perception system uh, called an encoder here, produces an estimate of the state of the world called S0, and that runs into a neural net called a policy network that just produces an action, and the action goes into the world. Uh, LLMs are like this. They are system one. You, you give them a prompt, that's X, they produce an action, that's the token they predict. Uh, that goes back into the world, and the world is very simpli simplistic here, it's just you shift in the input. Um, so no reasoning necessary. Here is system two. So you use the same system here, and this is a sort of time un unrolled version uh, of, uh, of the system. So we have the world model. The world model is this green module. And the different instances of that green model, module are the, the, the state of the system at different time steps. So think of it as like a recurrent net that you unfolded. Okay, so it's really the same module at different time steps. What the world model is supposed to be able to predict is given the a representation of the state of the world at time t and given an action that I'm imagining taking, what is going to be the predicted state of the world at time t plus one? Okay, so I can imagine a sequence of actions that I might take uh, imagine the effect on the world using my world model, and then I can plug the, the state of the world over this trajectory through my cost and measure whether my cost is gonna be minimized by this uh, uh, action sequence, my objectives, right? So, and, uh, so what I should do is run some sort of optimization procedure that will try to search for a sequence of actions that minimizes the cost given the prediction given to me by the, produced by the world model. This type of uh, planning 
is very classical in optimal control. It's called model predictive control. Um, in classical optimal control, most the, the model is not learned usually. It's just it's hand, handcrafted. Um, here we are thinking about a situation where the world model is learned by, for example, watching uh, the world go by, by video, but also by observing actions being taken in the world and seeing the effect, right? So um, to get a good, accurate model here, I'm going to have to observe the state of the world, observe, like take an action and observe the effect, or observe someone else take an action and observe the effect. Uh, let me skip this for now. <coughs> Ultimately, what we want is a hierarchical version of this because if you want to, uh, the system to be able to plan complex actions, we can't plan it at the lowest level. So for example, if I want to plan to go from here to New York City, um, I would have to uh, basically plan every millisecond exactly what muscle actions I should take. Okay, and it's impossible, right? You can't plan an entire trip from here to New York City millisecond by millisecond. Partly because you don't have a perfect model of the environment. Like you don't know if uh, uh, when you're going to walk up the room here, uh, whether someone is gonna be on the way, uh, in the way and you're gonna have to go around. So you can't completely plan in advance, right? So what we do is we plan hierarchically. We say like, okay, I wanna go to uh, New York City, so the cost function at the top here measures my distance to New York City. And the first thing I have to do is uh, go to the airport and catch a train, or uh, go to the train station and catch a train, or go to the airport, catch a plane. Um, so the, the top predictors are predictors at a high level that says, oh, okay, if I uh, catch a taxi, it might take me to the airport. If I catch, uh, or to the train station, then if I catch a train, it'll take me to New York City. Okay, so you have those, those two uh, hidden actions, those Z um, uh, variables here. And they define uh, a cost function for the, the next level down. So if the first action is um, uh, I'm taking a taxi to the train station, the lower level is uh, um, how do I catch a taxi here? I go down in the street and hail a taxi? No, this is Boston. I need to call an Uber or something. Okay, so, um, so I, go on, I go on the street and I call it Uber. Um, how do I go in the street? There's gonna be lower levels. Uh, I have to get out of this building. How do we get out of this building? I have to walk through the door. How do I walk through the door? I have to put one leg in front of the other, uh, avoid obstacles, and you know, all the way down to millisecond muscle control for a short period, which is replanned as, you, as we go. Okay, no AI systems today can do any of this. This is completely uh, virgin territory, okay? Um, there's a lot of people who've worked on hierarchical planning, but in situations where the representations at every level are hardwired, they, they're known in advance, they're predetermined. It's sort of like the equivalent of a vision system where the features at every level are hardwired, are designed by hand. Uh, there's no system today that can learn hierarchical representations for action plans. So that's a big challenge. Uh, the cost function, so um, Here's what's important here. A lot of people today are, working about, are, are talking about the fact that AI systems are difficult to control, are not steerable, uh, maybe toxic, you know, various things. Uh, the system I described cannot produce outputs that do not minimize the objectives. And so if you have terms in the objective that guarantee certain um, conditions, that system will have no choice but obeying those conditions, okay? So, Having a system that is designed like this, that whose output is produced by minimizing a set of objectives according to a model, will basically help guarantee the safety of that system because you can hardwire uh, intrinsic objectives uh, on the left here that basically guarantee the safety and the system cannot escape uh, the satisfaction of those constraints. So let me take a very simple example. Let's say someone figures out how to build a domestic robot that can cook. Uh, this robot you know, will have to be able to kind of handle a kitchen knife. And you might put a cost function that says, don't flail your arm if you have a kitchen knife in your arm and there is people around, okay, because it's dangerous. So you, you can imagine putting a lot of kind of safety conditions in those systems to make them steerable. So I don't think the problem of uh, making AI systems safe is such a huge problem that some people who are very vocal are saying it is that you know, AI is gonna kill us all. Um, 
it's not going to kill it all. Um, or we would have to screw up really badly for that to happen. Uh, okay, now here's the, here's the thing. How, how do we build the, the world model? Uh, and that's basically the, the biggest challenge that we have at the moment. How do we build a system that can predict what's going to happen uh, in the world? Uh, for example, by training itself to predict videos. Now, the problem with predicting videos is that the world is not entirely predictable. Um, it may not be deterministic, but even if it were deterministic, it wouldn't be completely predictable. So, in fact, uh, here is an example here. Um, if you, uh, you take a video, uh, this is a top-down video of a highway uh, that looks like cars driving around, is following uh, the blue car, and you train a neural net to predict what's going to happen in the video after the first few frames, it produces blurry, uh, it makes blurry prediction because it can't predict if the car that's behind you is going to accelerate or brake or you know, change lane or whatever. So it makes kind of an average of all the possible future and that's a blurry image. Same with, uh, this is an old paper where we attempted to do video prediction using neural nets and the predictions are blurry because you know, there's too many things that can plausibly happen and the system can only predict one thing so it predicts the average. Um, so that's no good. The solution to this is what I call a joint embedding predictive architecture. And this is really the most important slide of the talk. Um, so the normal way to make predictions is through a generative model. What's a generative model? It's a model where you have a bunch of variables you observe, let's say the initial segment of a video. You run it through an encoder and through a predictor and the predictor predicts Y, which is, let's say, the continuation of that video. And you have some cost function that measures the discrepancy divergence between the predicted y and the actual y you observe. Okay, this is when you train your your world model. Uh, it could be that the predictor has an action variable that comes in, but in this example there isn't. Um, so examples of this are things like uh, variational uh, autoencoders, mass autoencoders, or denoising autoencoders, which is a more general concept. And so basically all NLP systems, including LLMs, are of this type, the generative models. But here is the thing, you don't want to be predicting every detail about the world. Uh, here you have to predict every single detail about the world. So it's easy if it's text, because text is discrete, so predicting the next word, I cannot predict the next word from a text, but I can predict within 10 possible words uh, some probability distribution of the uh, over all the words in the dictionary of which word comes next, right? They can represent distributions over discrete, uh, uh, discrete variables. I cannot do this over the set of all possible video frames. I cannot usefully represent a distribution over the set of all possible video frames. Uh, so I can't use the same trick for video that is used for, for language. The reason why we have LLMs that work so well is because text is easy. Language is simple. I mean, it only popped up in the last few hundred thousand years anyway, so it can't be that complicated. Uh, and it's also processed in the brain by two tiny areas called the Wernicke area for understanding and the Broca area for production. What about the rest of the brain, the prefrontal cortex? That's where we think, okay? Um, that's not part of LLMs. The LLMs are perhaps good models of Wernicke and Broca, but that's it. Um, Okay, so what I'm proposing here is to replace this generative architecture by a joint embedding architecture. And the essential characteristic of it is that the variable that you want to capture the dependency of with respect to X goes itself through an encoder. And the encoder eliminates the irrelevant information that is not useful for anything. Okay, so for example, if I had uh, a video of this, uh, if I was shooting a video of, of, the, of the room here and then panning the camera and asking a system to predict, you know, what's the rest of the, of the room, it would probably predict that the rest of the room looks like the, you know, the initial uh, part that, you know, there'd be a lot of people in different seats, but it couldn't predict, uh, you know, your age, gender, hairstyle, clothing, um, or the texture, precise texture of the floor, uh, or things like that, right? So there's details that cannot possibly be predicted and uh, one way to avoid predicting them is to basically eliminate that information from the variable to be predicted through an encoder. Um, so that's the joint embedding architecture or predictive architecture because it has a predictor. Now there's an issue with this thing, which is that if you train a system with, let's say, a piece of video and the following piece of video, and you just train it to minimize the uh, prediction error, 
you train the whole thing, it collapses. It collapses, basically, uh, the encoders ignore the inputs. They produce constant vectors for SX and SY, and the predictor just needs to map SX to SY, and it's a constant, so it's super easy. OK? Bad. So the question now is, how do we prevent this from happening? How do we prevent a collapse? It doesn't happen with generative models, because um, they can collapse. So there are three flavors of those joint emitting architectures. Uh, a simple one where you're basically trying to make the two representations of SX and XY identical. So for example, X and Y are two different views of the same scene, and you, you want SX to represent the content of the scene, so it doesn't matter where you look it from. Uh, you just want to make the representations equal. Uh, when the encoders are identical, this is called a Siamese network. This is an old idea that goes back to the early 90s. Um, uh, you have deterministic joint embedding architectures, and then you have uh, joint predictive uh, architectures that are maybe non-deterministic, where the, fu the predictor function has a latent variable that could be drawn from a distribution or taken within a set that would allow that system to make multiple predictions if necessary. Um, now, we have, ourselves the, we have to ask ourselves the question of uh, how do we train those things, and I'm going to use a, a symbolism here where that I've used the, the, the rectangles and squares are cost functions, um, energy terms. The circles are variables, observed or not. And the, those symbols here are deterministic functions. Imagine a neural net, OK, trainable. We may have to hardwire some uh, cost functions in the system to have it, to drive it to focus on aspects of the input that are important. So that's the purpose of that C uh, cost function at the top. OK, but um, to explain how to train those things, um, I'm going to have to explain a little bit what uh, energy-based models uh, is about. Because the classical kind of probabilistic modeling in machine learning kind of goes out the window when we use the joint embedding architectures. Um, so what's an energy-based model? An energy-based model is uh, a, a learning system that captures the dependency between uh, two sets of variables, x and y, uh, through an energy function that is supposed to take low values, low energies, around uh, data, training samples. So imagine those black dots are training samples. You want that energy function, f of xy, to uh, take low values around the training samples and then higher values outside. And that system will capture the dependencies between x and y. If I give you a value of x and I ask you what can be the possible values for y, you're going to tell me, well, it's either this or that or maybe that other thing at the top. Okay, so it's not a mapping from x to y, it's an implicit function. And by figuring out what value of y minimizes the energy function, you can do inference. You can infer y, possibly. But you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, so that's energy-based model. It's kind of a weaker form of uh, modeling than probabilistic modeling. And so now the learning problem becomes, how do you train this energy function, which is going to be some big neural net, uh, so that the uh, energy takes low value around the training samples and high values outside? If you're not careful, you're going to get a collapse. So that the same type of collapse I was telling you about before, if you just pull down the energy of the training samples, minimize the prediction error in this joint embedding architecture, you're going to get zero energy for everything. That's not a good way to capture the dependencies. You have two classes of method, contrastive methods. So contrastive methods consist in generating those green points, which are outside the region of data, and then push their energy up while you push down on the energy of the data points. Okay, So that's going to create. Uh, a groove in the uh, energy surface, and the system will have captured the dependency between x and y. Uh, but there's an alternative here, which is uh, regularized methods, where the point of those methods is to minimize the volume of space that can take low energy, so that when you push down on the energy of uh, data points, uh, the rest of the space takes higher energy because there is only a, a small amount of uh, a small region of low energy to go around. So those are the two classes of methods. Every method you ever heard of in machine learning uh, can be viewed as one of those two. Most probabilistic methods actually belong to the contrastive uh, uh, category. Uh, anything that uses Monte Carlo sampling, for example, uh, uh, is uh, contrastive. And then things like uh, sparse coding and, and k-means and things like that are more on the regularized method uh, side of things. Um, OK, so um, I'm asking you to do four things. Abandon generative models in favor of the joint embedding architectures, right? So generative models are the most popular thing at the moment. Forget about it, uh, at least if you're interested in you know, getting to the next step in AI. 
abandon probabilistic models because if you have those joint embedding architectures, you cannot actually use it to derive a P of Y given X. The only thing you can use is this sort of energy-based view. Uh, abandon contrastive methods in favor of those regularized methods, which I'll talk about a, uh, a bit more. And then something I've said for many years now, abandon reinforcement learning because it's too inefficient. Um, so those are some of the pillars of machine learning. <laughs> And I realize this is not a very popular opinion here, but um, okay. So what about those regularized methods? I'm just going to give you one example. There's a whole bunch of them. There's like you know a dozen of them, but uh, but I'm just going to give you one uh, called Vicreg. And the basic idea of it is to prevent those representations from collapsing. We're going to use a criterion that attempts to maximize the information content that comes out of those representations. Okay, so we're going to measure the information content in some way and then maximize the information content or minimize the negative information content. We're going to do this for both SX and SY. We're also going to minimize the prediction error. And if we have a latent variable, we're going to have to minimize the information content of that latent variable. I can't explain why because it would take too long, but, um, but you have to do that also to prevent another type of collapse. I'm going to focus on how you do that. Um, so the sad news is we don't have good ways to measure information content or we don't have any good ways to estimate lower bounds on information content so that if we push up on this lower bound, the information content will go up. We only have upper bounds for information content. So we're going to do a very stupid thing, which is push up on the upper bound of information content and hope the actual information content will follow. And it works. Um, so there's a simple way to prevent um, the encoder from completely collapsing, which is to insist that every variable in SX Sx is a vector, and you insist that every variable, as measured over a batch, has a standard deviation that is at least one. Okay, so this is the the cost that you see at the top here. Uh, uh, measure the standard deviation of each component of Sx, uh, and put it in a hinge loss so that the standard deviation is at least one. So that prevents the system from completely collapsing, but uh, it can still cheat by making all the components of Sx equal or or correlated. So the the second term says, I want to minimize the off-diagonal terms of the covariance matrix of, uh, of those vectors measured over a batch. Right? So I want pairs of variables to be uncorrelated. So basically, the collection of those two criteria says, if I measure the covariance matrix of those vectors, Sx and Sy, coming out over a batch, I want the covariance matrix to be as close to the identity as possible. And there's a number of different uh, methods that have been proposed to uh, that are kind of similar to this, Barlow twins. Uh, so this, this one is called Vicreg from my group at uh, uh, Meta in collaboration with Jean Ponce. Um, and then variations of it, but like similar methods from, uh, uh, from Berkeley uh, in uh, uh, Yima's group at Berkeley called NCR squared. Yeah. So this works really well. And I'm going to not bore you with tables of result that show you how well it works. Uh, only to mention something else, which is uh, another method to do this kind of self-supervised learning, that is, which is closer to this JEPA architecture uh, called uh, iJEPA. So this is for learning features for images uh, without having to do data augmentation, but basically through masking. And this works amazingly well. It's very fast. It's a new method. Uh, paper is on, is on archive. Um, I don't have time to explain how it works, but uh, basically you, um, uh, you run an image through two encoders. One is the full image, and the other one is sort of a masked image, partially masked image. You run them through the same encoder, or very similar encoder, and then you train a predictor to predict the full uh, feature representation of the full image from the representation obtained from the partial image. And just doing this uh, produces really good features for images. You get really good performance on uh, object recognition in images and stuff like that. Again, tables that show you that's true. But I'm coming to the end. So uh, the, re the reason for training those JEPA is to build uh, world models. So architectures of this type. So this is a JEPA, but it's also a world model that given an observation about the state of the world is going to be able to, and an action or imagined action and latent variable is going to predict what's going to happen next in the world. And once the, the time passes by, we're going to observe what happens and then perhaps adjust our system um, to, to train. But we want to uh, use a hierarchical version of this where we can have a higher level, higher abstraction 
higher level of abstraction uh, representation that will allow us to make predictions further in the future. Okay, I can't tell you the details of how I'm going to get to the train station, but I know I'm going to be, have to be at the train station around 4 p.m. Okay, um, so that's the, the high level. And we have uh, early experiments with sort of various complicated neural net architectures, which I'm not going to detail, to train from video, try to predict basically what's going to happen in the video using warping and stuff like that, and it works really well. But uh, in the end, what we'll have is uh, a hierarchical system from which we can do hierarchical planning, uh, and we'll have been trained to predict what's going to happen in the world as a consequence of actions or latent variables that we can observe, that we can uh, uh, infer. Um, and, uh, and those systems will be able to plan and reason and will be controllable because the behavior is entirely controlled by the cost functions we ask it to minimize. And so much more controllable than current uh, LNMs. Uh, and that's pretty much the end. So self-supervised learning is really the ticket. Handling uncertainty can be done with this energy-based uh, uh, model method and using the joint embedding architecture that uh, allows us to avoid predicting all the details that are irrelevant about the world. Uh, learning world models from observation and interaction and then reasoning and planning is done by uh, basically gradient-based minimization with respect to actions. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for the great talk. Now we will have the second part, which is the Farsa chat between Jan and Usama. So, please. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Jan. It was uh, actually truly inspirational because it is definitely different than your typical machine learning talk. <laughs> so, I, I enjoyed that. Well, I tell you to throw away all the basic pillars of machine learning, so yes. <laughs> um, so I've collected a bunch of questions, some coming from the audience, some coming from our institute and our faculty. And we'll try to go through them in 20 minutes or, or whatever we can cover. Uh, normally, I would commit to answering every question on social media. But because we got 150 questions, I'm afraid to commit my time or yours to this at this point. But we'll, we'll try our best. Uh, so I'll start with my first question. It's been a long-standing wisdom in statistical inference and probabilistic reasoning that when the number of parameters of a model gets large enough, you kind of lose your ability to generalize and you start just memorizing data. And we all know that that's no good. That's just too detailed, the bias variance uh, trade-off. But somehow, deep learning seems to have broken through this barrier when we went from regular neural nets to the deep nets. And, and is there an, an, an intuition or understanding today as to why this is working in LLMs with hundreds of billions and now trillions of parameters? Right. Well, the, the fact that it is working, that you can train a ridiculously over, oversized neural net and it will still uh, work reasonably and generalize uh, is, is uh, dumbfounding so much that it contradicts every single thing that has been written in every statistical textbook. That you should never have more parameters than you have training samples, right? If you're fitting a polynomial or something like this. But we knew experimentally, even in the late 80s and early 90s, that uh, you could make those neural nets pretty big. And you know, even if you didn't, didn't have a huge amount of training data, it would still uh, work pretty well. There was just no theoretical explanation. So the theorists told us, you're wrong, you're stupid. Um, this cannot possibly work, so I'm not going to believe your results. Uh, and that, that's in part what made it very difficult to get neural nets uh, accepted in the late 90s to um, the 2000s. Um, but it turns out there is a phenomenon that has since been named uh, double descent, which is that uh, if you increase the number of parameters in a model um, for a constant size training set, uh, your training error, of course, is going to go down, right? to zero, probably. Uh, but your test error is go first going to go down, go to a minimum, and then go up. Uh, when you start having parameters, a number of parameters that is commensurate with the number of samples that you have. Okay, So that's when the model starts to be over-parameterized. Uh, and it goes up. But here is the thing. If you keep going up, if you keep making the model more complex, 
the, er the test error will go down again. It will go through a maximum and then go down again. That's called the double descent phenomenon nowadays. Um, and it will do this if you regularize the parameters somehow. Um, you don't necessarily need to regularize explicitly because neural nets have some sort of implicit regularization in them. But you see this, this phenomenon. Um, even, even works if you, if you fit uh, a polynomial, right? Fit a 10-degree polynomial with, uh, with 11 data points. And you know, you, your fit would be horrible, right? Because the polynomial has to go to every single point and it's going to go wild in between. But if you increase the degree of the polynomial to something like 20 or 30, and you regularize the coefficient, your error goes down again. Your test error goes down again. The, the fitted polynomial goes through every point, but it's less irregular uh, than with just uh, degree 10. So this existed all along. It's just that people didn't realize that uh, it, was, it was a thing, or at least people who were not practitioners of neural nets who had realized this was a thing. But do we have any explanation why this is a thing? Um, so uh, there's a lot of conjectures. There is uh, some theoretical work. Uh, some people claim it's about the dynamics of uh, gradient descent. There is some sort of implicit self-regularization in neural nets that occurs, um, where, whereby the, the system kind of recruits just the number of virtual parameters that it needs somehow. Uh, some say it's regularization due to a stochastic gradient. So stochastic gradient descent, which is, is noisy, and so uh, perhaps that uh, forces the system to, tr to find robust minima in the uh, objective, in the loss that uh, generalize better. Um, it's not clear. There's a bunch yeah. of different things. Yeah. Definitely one of the mysteries that keep us interested. Um, this question comes from uh, Raman Chandrasekharan, or Chandra, who's one of our senior research scientists in Seattle. Um, how long before LLM, and maybe, I don't know, models in general, can genuinely start saying, I don't know the answer to this question, as opposed to attempting to guess the right autocomplete anyway, because that's what it's programmed to do. Yeah, so I think, uh, I don't think current LLMs can really do this at the moment. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably possible with architecture of the type that I, I show, because um, if there are no good minima to the objective that the system is attempting to minimize to produce a, its output, it's going to say, well, I found this thing, it seems to be minimizing this objective, but, but not very well, so probably it's not the right answer you were looking for. Um, or by the shape of the minimum, of the, uh, this energy minimum, perhaps you could say like if it's really a sharp minimum, then that's the one answer that corresponds to the, to the uh, question. If it's kind of a shadow minimum, maybe there are multiple answers that are possible. So you might be able to attribute, uh, to map, uh, uh, energy levels to, of, of, of different answers to, uh, to uh, confidence levels. Yep. Two, um, this is a question from me, I guess. Two, two aspects of critical importance to, say, GPT or large language models that are not talked about a lot by the companies who do them are data curation, so getting that clean data, that balanced data, that representative data, which, by the way, counter to popular belief, open AI spent a lot of its money on, on curating just that right corpus so that they can do the training reliably. And the, the second part, um, which is something we're big believers in at the Institute for Experiential AI. Experiential AI stands for AI with the human in the loop. Having that human intervention through relevance feedback mm -hmm. that we know now open AI is doing and has been doing, and some of the queries are actually taken over by humans at some point when they make enough errors to come back. But the good thing is they learn from them, and we think that's a great practice. Why do you think the companies don't want to talk about the importance of the data and the importance of the human in the loop? Well, I don't know if they don't want to talk about it. I mean, it's clearly. Uh very expensive to collect, curate yes. data to produce a good, uh, a good LLM. Uh, but in my opinion, it's, it's doomed to failure in the, in the long run for two reasons. The, the first one is uh, uh, the curation you know, requires going through this you know, enormous amount of, uh, of uh, data that you want to train the system on. And, and any data you eliminate, you know, it's less training data for your model. Um, 
But the second thing is, um, uh, even with uh, human feedback, rather, uh, human feedback that rate you know, different answers or, or, or fine tune the system for certain question and answers, uh, sort of manually uh, uh, curated, if you want those systems ultimately to be the repository of uh, all human knowledge, the dimension of that space of all human knowledge is enormous. And you're not going to do it by you know, paying a few thousand people in Kenya or in India uh, rating answers. You're going to have to do it with millions of volunteers that uh, you know, fine tune the, the system for all possible questions that might possibly be asked. And those volunteers will have to be vetted um, uh, in the way Wikipedia is, is being done, right? So think of LLMs in the long run as uh, a version of Wikipedia plus your favorite newspapers plus the scientific literature plus everything, uh, but you can talk to it. You don't have to read articles, you can just talk to it. And so if, it, if it's supposed to become the repository of all human knowledge, the, the, the thing it's been uh, trained to do will have to be curated by, by crowdsourcing the way Wikipedia is uh, to cover all the possible uh, things that uh, may, be, may be covered. This is a very strong argument for having open source uh, based models uh, for, for, for LLMs. So in my opinion, the future is inevitably going to be that you're going to, be, you're going to have a small number of uh, open source based LLMs that are not trained for any particular application, they just are you know, they, they, they train on like enormous amounts of data that requires a lot of money. So you're not going to have 25 of them. You're going to have two or three. And then uh, actual applications are going to be built on top of it by fine tuning those systems for particular vertical uh, applications. That's the future. Sadly, in the industry, there are people who are lobbying uh, governments to actually make the open sourcing of large, uh, large scale LLM illegal. What they're worried about is, uh, you know, potential misuse of LLMs by bad actors, uh, potential uh, uses. Uh, uh, so some people in, in the US, for example, are worried, oh, if we open source our LLMs, you know, uh, China and North Korea and Iran will put their hands on it, and that's going to be bad. Um, and then some people are worried that, you know, the real powerful LLMs are going to be super intelligent and destroy humanity, uh, which I think is preposterous. Uh, even though some of my friends that I respect actually believe this. Um, so I think it would be really, really bad if uh, those lobbying attempts uh, succeed. I'm very much in favor of a future with uh, open uh, based models. And there's going to be bad actors, but there's going to be countermeasures against them. It's going to be, you know, or powerful, good AI cop against their nefarious AI, essentially. So let's shift to this uh, trend. And, and this is, I've merged a question from Jimmy Shanahan uh, from our AI Solutions Hub with questions from Tomo Lasovich and Ken Church at, at EAI. Um, the trend nowadays seems to be heading towards bigger is better. More compute, more parameters. Uh, there's been some studies even suggesting that by open AI themselves that they're, they're moving at a face at a, at a pace faster than Moore's law, uh, even though now they seem to be normalizing towards it, although Moore's law itself is, is slowing down. So, so the, the real question here is, uh, how long can this go on? And will we ask them to it? What do you think? I know that we may not have the final answer here, but it seems crazy. Like, all you have to do is wait a few weeks, and you hear about the next big model. Well, so actually, in the last few months, you, you've seen a decrease in the size. Uh, so Llama, for example, uh, the 13 billion version of Llama in terms of uh, raw performance on standard benchmarks is actually better than GPT-3, which has 175 billion uh, parameters. And so uh, it's not clear that bigger is better. With the architecture I propose, I think you can get away with smaller, uh, smaller systems that uh, perform at least as well. The reason being that when you train in a current autoregressive LLM, you have to train it to not just accumulate knowledge, not just predict the next word, but also solve a lot of problems. So basically, you know, know how to produce the right answer when you specify the, the question in the prompt. And so everything is wrapped into the weights of that single model. Whereas in the model I propose here, this is the architecture I propose, uh, the word model is just a word model. The task is specified by the objective function. 
okay, which may include the prompt. So it may include a representation of the prompt. Uh, and so you're separating uh, different things. You're separating the inference uh, 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 procedure that produces the output from the world model, the sort of the mental model of the world that the system uses, from the task itself, which is specified by the objective. And you can probably get away with uh, smaller networks for the same performance. But, uh, but yes, uh, um, I mean, there were a few years ago, you know, models by Google that had like a trillion parameters. There were basically multiple models that were stuck together uh, with some sort of, uh, you know, the palm. gating, oh, yeah, uh, between them. Uh, they've kind of backpedaled on this a little bit. If you want those systems to be practical, like to be used by everyone, yeah, you can't make them like a trillion parameters right now. It'd be just too expensive. Uh, so you have to minimize that size. Now you can run things like Lab Llama uh, 7 billion on uh, on, on, a, on a Mac, um, you know, it can run on a laptop. You can't train it on a laptop, but you can run it. <laughs> yes. Um, so clearly, you, you believe you're advocating for a, a different view what the machine learning and AI community should be, should be doing, as opposed to what they are doing today. Uh, and this that's, the, that's the story of my career. Yes. <laughs> and, and this question is coming from Ken Church. Uh, um, a senior. former colleague from AT&T. Yes, from AT&T. He is at e, uh, the Institute for AI in Silicon Valley. Do you believe, well, I guess the question is, how long do you think it will take to pivot the field from where it is to where you would like it to be? <laughs> uh, well, last time I tried, it took 15 years. <laughs> um, if not more, actually, depending on how you count, it might have been 20. Uh, so. Um, I don't know. I think I, I, I see a phenomenon in the kind of, uh, this is a sociology of science question. When there is something that seems to work, everybody gets excited about it. And there's a you know, fashion trend type phenomenon where you know, every paper uh, you know, written is, is about this trend. I saw this in computer vision you know, back in the early to mid 2000. Oh, yeah. Everybody was working on, on boosting. You know, that was the thing, like you, know, you had to work on boosting for computer vision. And then you know, someone in 20, uh, 2006 and, and five uh, came up with a different way of doing vision using dense uh, features like SIFT and stuff like that, using um, unsupervised running for a middle layer and then an SVM on top. And all of a sudden, everybody was doing this. Okay? And then starting in 2013, everybody started using convolutional nets. Um, uh, that, that came from, from results. So now we are in a phase where everybody is focused on LLMs. And uh, if you don't work on LLMs, nobody wants to talk to you. <laughs> but it will change. Yeah. So you think it's 15 years? No, I think, <laughs> it's, I think it's more like five. Like I made that prediction that autoregressive LLMs uh, will, will probably five years, disappear that's true. Yeah. within that's, five They're years. doomed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I might be wrong, obviously. We, we, we will hold you to that. I'll, I'll come back and revisit in five years. Maybe it's a wishful thinking. <laughs> Self-fulfilling prophecy, perhaps. Um, a, a question for something different here from uh, Sam Scarpino, Director of AI and Life Sciences at the Institute for Experiential AI. What are the biggest gaps on the education side for graduates of higher education in AI, and in particular, the new directions AI is taking? What, what, what do you think is, is missing? So uh, I think what's, what's missing, so it depends which uh, you know, which major you're, you're following. Um, most uh, computer science uh, curricula in the US are very weak in mathematics. The requirements for mathematics uh, in a typical CS degree, the minimum requirement is very, very small, right? It's one course in discrete math and perhaps linear algebra if you're lucky, uh, maybe probability if you are courageous. Yep. Uh, but like, what about optimization? Like, that would be kind of something that would be very useful. And then there is uh, uh, courses in physics because the mathematics of inference and uh, you know rational autoencoder and stuff like that, uh, you know graphical models, uh, etc. The mathematics of this is from st uh, statistical physics. Uh, and so, if you have the choice between taking a course in I don't know mobile app programming or quantum mechanics, take quantum mechanics. I'm not kidding. <laughs> hmm. um, 
This is a question that came from the audience and a few of, of the people at the Institute. Um, your thoughts on the current, you know, these recent congressional hearings where uh, s certainly seems like much of the testimony by Sam Altman was understandably self-serving, you know, they need to be allowed to compete and have their way of working protected. At the same time, he's encouraging the rest of the community to be open source. Um, what would you have said to Congress had you been on those hearings? <laughs> I was not invited. Uh, I was not invited to the White House either before that. Um, so uh, what I would have recommended is that if you, uh, if you want a vibrant ecosystem on top of current AI technology, um, you need to have uh, uh, sort of open source based models on top of which an industry can be built. And that industry will, will build uh, vertical applications uh, for particular domains on top of a base model. You don't want to have uh, 25 companies to, uh, selling 25 different base models um, and keep them closed source. If you want an industry to, to be built on top of it, the infrastructure has to be open. Uh, because that's the only way to really sort of know what you're doing, essentially. Uh, and to have some control about your future, right? You, you can't just go like this and pray U that Unix OpenAI. versus Windows. Right, so if you go back to the history of the internet, there was a similar story where uh, back in 1992 when uh, Bill Clinton and Al Gore started to figure out like what, you know, how do we build the information superhighway? Um, they went to see uh, you know, the big uh, communication companies like AT&T and AT&T told them, oh, you know, leave it to us, we'll build the stuff is going to be, you know, ATM and ISDN to the home and blah, blah, blah. It'd be wonderful. And you'll have to pay, you know, $5 per hour. Um, and Al Gore said no. He said, we're going to make the, what was then ARPANET that became the internet, um, basically available to the public and, and delocalized and, uh, you know, self, uh, you know, basically open in terms of uh, standard. And no company is going to control it. And that was a really, really good idea. Uh, we can thank Al Gore for this. The, the world can thank Al Gore, not just the U.S. Um, <laughs> uh, he did invent the internet. Um, and then a similar story happened several years later when people started to realize that you could use, uh, you know, graphic browsers like uh, like uh, Mosaic and Netscape and stuff like that, right? Uh, when the when the the World Wide Web become became popular. Um, so there was a war between Sun Microsystems and, and Microsoft. Sun Microsystems said, oh, we're going to sell you servers running Solaris, a version of Unix, with, you know, our web server infrastructure and Java. And you're going to be able to build like, anything you want. Microsoft said, no, it's going to be Windows NT with the IIT web server and the ASP uh, website, you know, uh, server-side uh, 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 protocol framework, whatever. They both lost. So Microsystem went bankrupt, uh, was sold for parts to Oracle, and Microsoft ex essentially exited the, the, the market. What won was Linux and Apache, open source. And the reason is because uh, it's such a essential basic infrastructure that it has to be open. Um, it progresses faster if it's open, and it's more reliable, uh, it's, less, it's more secure, I mean, there's all the advantages, and you know, it's easier for startups to build on top of it. So in the future, we are going to see AI systems as basic infrastructure. All of our interaction 10 years from now with the digital world will be through an intelligent virtual agent that will be with us all the time. It's like every one of us will have a staff of intelligent people working for us. Okay, We shouldn't be threatened by the fact that those things would be smarter than us, like everybody that is, a, you know, is working with me at, at FAIR is smarter than me, so um, I don't feel threatened by that. You're not a very good manager if you're threatened by people who are smarter than you. So um, your purpose actually should be to hire people, only people who are smarter than you. But anyway, uh, so we're going to have those intelligent systems that are, be, are going to be under, under our control, they're going to help us in our daily lives. And we need those systems to be open because if, if it's kind of a closed system controlled by some company uh, in California, it's going to be able to control our entire uh, uh, 
knowledge and data diet. And that's just too dangerous. And it's, and it's not necessary. It's necessary for a search engine or a social network because it has to be centralized for various reasons. But for an agent like this, it could, it could run on your local device. It could run on your laptop. You, you don't have to talk necessarily with big servers uh, in California. You, you don't want to give all your you know, deeper secret, uh, secrets to, to that. So, um, so it's going to have to be an a open platform for that reason. Uh, if nothing else, uh, governments uh, around the world are going to insist that this is the case. So that's what I would tell uh, Congress. Um, make it so that, like, don't, don't ban open source uh, LLMs. They're not going to destroy humanity. Um, yeah, they're going to be bad actors, but, you know, you can have countermeasures. Um, and make it open. It's the only way to make it safe. Um, I'll ask, we'll make this a quick question with a quick answer, and then I know we have some questions live, so we'll, we'll, we'll switch to those. Um, if, in a way, you kind of answered this question when you said LLMs are doomed, but if, if LLMs were to become perfect, at least in language, would that, give us, would that ever give us insight into how language and natural language understanding works? Uh, the language model today is distributed over these billions of parameters. And do you think we'll ever have an understandable LLM? Like, for example, we use PCA to understand what regression is doing? <laughs> or is that hopeless? Uh, at some point, I think it's going to be relatively hopeless. I mean, we'll, we'll probably learn a lot about you know, how the systems represent data and like, how they manipulate it and stuff like that. So this is not opaque, right? We can completely kind of this complete visibility on how, how the systems um, uh, operate. Now, the question is understanding really how the decisions are being made. So I'm actually not particularly interested in those questions, like, you know, as long as they, they work properly. Um, the same way I'm not particularly interested in figuring out exactly how the brain works. I'm more interested in figuring out how the brain builds itself so that it works, right? So I'm more interested in learning than in studying uh, the result of learning, if you want. So it's the same for, for, those, for those systems. More interested in how you get them to learn what you want. And how they solve the problem in the end is kind of considerably less interesting, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, at some point, they're going to be you know, super intelligent, repository of all human knowledge. You know, it's going to be too big for us to kind of comprehend um, at a deep level. Fair. Um. And by the way, I failed to acknowledge that question came from Walid Saba, who's one of our senior research scientists at uh, the EAI up in uh, Portland, Maine. Uh, the next question I'll, I'll use, and then I'll switch over to audience questions, um, comes from Jean Tunick, the director of AI Plus Health at the Institute for Experiential AI. Um, you believe that deep learning can eventually lead to human-like understanding. And you have said that self-supervised learning from unlabeled data uh, can be a powerful tool, tool, although it seems like in human learning, as I was watching your examples, for example, a lot of that data is, in a way, supervised or tied to some kind of reinforcement feedback around what to expect. Is it good? Is it bad? Yeah. Et cetera. So how, where do you draw that line between you know, uh, is, is the, you know, can we really truly be, go towards unsupervised? Or there's a hu huge dependence on supervised and on those labels to get it right. Because the world is, in a way, is telling us indirectly through supervision. So self-supervised running, I mean, the reason it's called self-supervised is that deep down it's actually supervised running. <laughs> It's just supervised running where the supervision signal is the input itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so in a way, that's kind of you know a kind of uh, uh, simple answer to, to that to that question. It's still supervised running in the end, but um, with particular architectures to handle uncertainty and things and dimensionality and things like that. Uh, regarding reinforcement learning, there is a point at which you need some form of reinforcement learning, and you need you need it for in two situations or or at least techniques that had been developed in the context of, of uh, reinforcement learning. The first situation is if the objective function 
that is optimized by your system does not reflect the ultimate objective function you actually want to optimize. Uh, so for example, you're learning to uh, ride a bike, the objective function is uh, the you know, uh, time to the next uh, fall <laughs> or something, uh, and, uh, uh, or the inverse time to next fall, you want to minimize that, right? Um, but you don't know how to compute this from the internal state of, uh, of your system. Uh, and so you need uh, to train an objective function to approximate this real cost, which in the context of reinforcement learning is called a critic. Uh, so that's when you need uh, one of those things. The other situation where you need it is when your world model is not uh, accurate because it's not being trained in all corners of the state space and you happen to be in a part of the state space yeah. that it wasn't trained on. Uh, your world model is gonna be bad and your predictions are gonna be bad, your planning is gonna be bad. Uh, so to prevent this, you need uh, to train your world model uh, using uh, things that are called curiosity or exploration. And that's another concept that comes from reinforcement learning. So don't completely abandon reinforcement learning, but minimize its use. As we switch over to the, to the live questions, let me, I, I can't help but ask you this question. It comes from several anonymous uh, people as well as Ken Church, uh, your former colleague. Did you actually say the revolution will not be supervised? I did, yeah. <laughs> okay. But I, actually, I stole it uh, from Aliosha Efros from Berkeley. Uh -huh. He had a magnificent, uh, magnificent slide that uh, was a picture of uh, a, a, a wall painting in, uh, in Chile someplace, uh, which was one of those kind of revolutionary thing. And uh, he took that picture and overlaid on it. Um, the revolution will not be supervised, yes. Um, okay. I, so I saw that from him. I, I deserve no credit. Shall we switch over to a question from the audience? Yeah. So first question from Glenn Jenkinson is, what two questions about AI do you wish you were asked more often? <laughs> two questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I get asked a lot of questions. I can't imagine a question I've not been asked. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's relevant. Um, I mean, I think the important questions are the ones that I'm asking myself, and I wish other people would sort of frame the problems in the same, in the same way. So, big question, how is it that any teenager can learn to drive a car in 20 hours, and we still don't have level five autonomous driving? That was the first question. So, second question is, what are we missing? Mm. That's, the, that's the answer I want. <laughs> Sure. Next question from Juan Lalinda. Do you think quantum computing will have a significant role in the future of AI? No. <laughs> or at least not anytime soon. Uh, by the time this happens, I probably won't be alive anymore, so I don't, I'm not taking a big risk. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, there's you know, precious few situations today where quantum computing could be useful. There's no situation where it actually is useful because um, the quantum computers are not big enough at the moment. So it's a huge bet. I think scientifically it's, it's fascinating. Like I'm, I'm really fascinated by quantum computing at the conceptual level. Uh, I have one or two papers with Seth Lloyd on, on connections between neural nets and, and quantum, quantum computing. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic, but I don't think it has any practical uh, value in the short term. Sure. One last question from Anton de Burra. To what extent do you see ML models being used for problems that we already have pretty good algorithms to solve, such as sorting, shortest path, linear, integer programming, and so on? How would you characterize the boundary, if any? So there's a lot of problems that we can currently solve that are, you know, NP-complete or NP-hard. Um, and so we can solve them within limits. Uh, what we need very often are uh, approximate algorithms, so methods that give us approximate solutions to complex problems that, you know, uh, in theory are NPR, NP complete, whatever, but, um, but if you reduce yourself to accepting approximate solutions, it might become uh, solvable. Uh, so I think there is a lot for, to be said for ML methods 
that do something that has become to be known as amortized inference. So amortized inference is this idea that you might have a problem that is formulated as an optimization problem. Every, prob every computing problem can be formulated as an optimization problem. Uh, and you, what you might be able to do is uh, solve that problem in certain cases, so you give a solution. And now what you do with this is that you train a neural net of some kind to predict, to approximate the solution to that optimization problem from the specification of the problem, from the inputs, right? And so that system will not be able to completely solve the problem in all situations, but for the type of problem that you train it on, uh, it's gonna be able to give you an approximate solution really quickly. Amortized inference. There is a tutorial on this that is, was uh, written and, 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 and given at a recent conference by one of my uh, colleagues at FAIR called Brendan Amos, A-M-O-S. Um, very interesting concept. I will close my questions with one last question, then we'll take a, a real live one and call it the end. Uh, I have to use this. It comes from one of our, fa our faculty who wanted to remain anonymous. I don't know why, but given the big excitement around LLMs and not without a reason, what are some of the research directions that are possible to tackle for non-Google slash Facebook type sized institutions that are under studies? Space for foundational research, big open questions, in need of creative solutions. Thus, if you were a young investigator today, like a starting assistant professor, uh, what would you do in this environment? I mean, that's a problem I have to face when I, I have you know, PhD students at NYU. They don't have access to you know, 16,000 GPUs, right? Unlike people at FAIR. So um, I think a lot of, like most good ideas still come from academia. So you're not gonna beat you know, uh, Google or, or Meta uh, or Microsoft on you know, beating the record on translation or something like that. Uh, you don't wanna do this in universities. Uh, but come up with, coming up with new ideas. For example, the problem I, I, I mentioned of how do you do hierarchical planning, how you train a system to, to figure out um, you know, how to represent the, the world and action spaces so that you can do hierarchical planning. It's completely unsolved. You can do this with like toy problems. If you have any idea of how you might approach that problem on toy problems, you don't require, you don't, you don't have to have like tons of GPUs for that. Um, you will have an idea that might have a huge impact. Uh, so um, if you have like a good architecture that you can show, can, can learn you know, some simple world model from video, it's the same, you don't have to train on like all of YouTube. You, you can train on you know, artificial environments and stuff like that and sort of demonstrate that it works. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be like large scale. So this is the kind of stuff you wanna do. And then there is a new domain which is building on top of open source base models. So unfortunately right now, uh, the best base models, um, uh, LLMs are the, the LAMA uh, class of models from seven billion to 65 billion. Uh, they're not usable for commercial use. They are uh, distributed with a license that for non-commercial use, so only for research, which you can of course use in the university. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done to kind of figure out how to make those things uh, you know, safe, factual, et cetera, and you can you know, work from those base models. You don't have to retrain them from scratch. Yeah. So you don't need to have you know, room full, room, you know, rooms full of GPUs. We'll try for one last question, maybe two. Go ahead, please, with your question. Hi. Uh, so my question really dwells from the side of, or we'd love to hear your thoughts on impact and control of these large language models or any of these models, uh, the fancy models that you showed with billions of trillions of parameters. So the impact side is, do you really give, or how much thought do you give to the impact that would have on the community or on the people in general based on what that model does? And control is, once that model is out there, uh, how do I make sure that it doesn't do a certain things it's not supposed to do with, with, with regular, uh, the, the way we, people used to use internet before those models, it used to be very controlled environment where you could have, to, in a way, regulate the, the, those environments, but now with models, it's getting increasingly difficult and a slow process to have or do not have certain things in those models. Okay, so there is a, a long view, a very positive one, which is, Imagine that all of us have those uh, assistants with superhuman intelligence. So it's like every one of us has kind of a staff of uh, people working for us, but like super people working for us. Uh, this is gonna create a new 
a new renaissance for humanity, right? It's going to increase um, humanity's intelligence, uh, however you want to measure it. Um, that has to be intrinsically good. Um, it's, it's been the case you know, in the past that uh, any time a, a new medium was invented or a new way of communication was invented, like the printing press, um, you know, humanity kind of went to the next step. Right? The printing press uh, you know, led um, uh, the dissemination of uh, you know, philosophy, science, uh, secularism, democracy, uh, all that stuff. The US would not exist without uh, you know, the, the French philosophers of uh, uh, the 18th century. So, uh, uh, and neither would the French Revolution. And so, uh, so I think, you know, same for the internet, right? That gave people instant access to an enormous wealth of, of, of knowledge. Also disinformation, but okay, I mean, we have to have countermeasures for, you know, every technology can be used for good and bad. Um, we need to have countermeasures for the, the worst, the worst uh, aspects. But ultimately, I think um, we need, you know, widest possible access to those AI systems by, by, uh, by everyone. Um, now, how do we make sure those systems don't lie to us? Um, uh, how do we make sure that the information they give us is not under the control of someone that has nefarious purpose, you know, things like that, which is, I think, a good reason for them to be open, uh, as, I, as I stated earlier. Uh, but I think it's a, a bright future for humanity, you know, um, contrary to some people who tell young people don't expect to live long, I mean, which is nuts. Uh, I think it's a very bright future. Okay. I, um, I know you've been waiting for the next question, but we are five minutes over our time limit, and I know we have to grab a bite and deliver you to the train station on time, right. according to the hierarchical plan. <laughs> so with that, please join me in thanking Jan for an amazing session today. Thank you.